Let us pray. Heavenly Father, open our hearts as we open your word. Show us our salvation in Jesus. In his name we pray these things. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, if you would open a Bible to the middle of Luke 2, particularly verses 29 to 32, uh, we're looking at the third of these three psalm-like poems at the beginning of Luke's Gospel. Uh, we had Mary's Magnificat a few weeks back. Uh, last week was Zachariah's Benedictus. And this week we have what is known as either the Song of Simeon, or if you want to get fancy, the Nuc Dimittis, uh, after the first two words in Latin, uh, now release, or now dismiss. And traditionally in the church, this prayer was said in evening prayer services at the close of day, which makes sense since this song has the feeling of, um, of a peaceful ending, as it were, uh, of death, frankly. Uh, the peaceful and trusting anticipation for the faithful believer which is prefigured every day with the coming of night and sleep. Anyway, I, what I'm trying to say is I hope you're ready to move on from all that cheery Christmas stuff this morning. Um, what I want to do is just two things. First, uh, just walk through what's happening here. Uh, what's happening, why, and what's Simeon saying in light of that? What is he, like Mary and Zachariah, rejoicing in? And second, like the other two poems, I want us to see in Simeon's song an image of the Christian life, if you will, what, which makes sense. Uh, there's a reason why all these songs have played such a major role in the historic prayer life of the church. They're words that can be on the lips of any Christian. You know, here we have, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. And what I'm hoping we see is that Simeon celebrates here the particular relationship that someone in Christ has to death, um, and specifically death as a result of sin and judgment in condemnation. That is, in Christ we have a, a new and changed relationship to death because of the salvation we have in, in the person, in the person of Jesus Christ. So let's uh, look at our story in the song first, then we'll try to dig into all that other stuff a little bit later. All right, so first, what's happening? Uh, if you look, Jesus' family has gone up to Jerusalem. One, they've gone up for the ritual purification of Mary after childbirth, and possibly Joseph, who might have touched her during this period and two, for the ritual presentation of their firstborn to the Lord. Now, there's lots of stuff here that has to do with Leviticus and legal codes and all Old Testament-y stuff that I would love to geek out about and get into, uh, but Brian has told me the band will start playing if I do. So um, I can't go there, so let's just note two things. One, one of the things Luke wants you to see is they are fulfilling the law. They are fulfilling the requirements of the law, all of its ceremonial um, um, requirements. And two, Luke wants you to see that they are poor. They're poor. Uh, you see in verse 24, it says that they offered up two birds for sacrifice. That's the option that's permitted if you are too formed to afford, afford the, yearly, uh, the yearling lamb, which is the proper offering. Right? But that, that makes what Simeon does all the more interesting. I mean, Jesus' family is completely unremarkable in this context. They are part of the unwashed masses in Jerusalem that might have come to the temple that day. And yet Simeon, led by God, comes to the temple, and let's look at verse 27. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. Now, if you think about that too much as a parent, it could seem a little scary there, right? This guy waiting for this kid and then grabbing him out of nowhere, right? And grabbing him when he sees him, right? But the more interesting thing is, in a way, Simeon comes out of nowhere for you and I. Uh, everybody else we've been introduced to in Luke's narrative up to this point has been given some kind of a backstory. We know kind of where they fit in. We know the facts about Zachariah and Elizabeth, for example. He's an old priest in the division of Abiyah at the temple. Right? Mary's a young woman in Galilee, betrothed to Joseph of the house of David. And if you keep reading right after our passage, uh, there's a really short story about this prophetess, Anna. Uh, even she is identified as old, widowed, living at the temple, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, right? You get all these specifics. But Simeon, we don't know jack about his background, okay? His tribe, his age, where he's from, everybody, every painting you see of him just assumes he's this old man. Maybe he's a priest at the temple. But none of that's here. None of that's here. What do we know about him? Let's look at verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem, <clears throat> doesn't mean he's from Jerusalem, whose name was Simeon, it's a common name, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, 
and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, or the Messiah. So, we know, one, his name. We know he's righteous and favored by God. We know he's waiting for the Messiah, and that God has revealed to him through the Holy Spirit that he will see the Messiah before he dies. That's it. Okay? Uh, it's mainly his spiritual character and standing. For the moment, just file that in the back of your head. Right? Let's move on. So he grabs the baby Jesus. I'm just going to believe that he asks his mother first and all that. And he bursts into this hymn of thanksgiving and praise. What does he say? Well, I, th I think we can boil it down to four things. Four things. One, he's saying that this baby he's holding in his arms is his salvation. Right? Verse 30, for my, eye, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Um, this isn't just a God is with us moment, right? We've moved on a bit from just a Christmas Emmanuel kind of thing because Simeon is saying this. He's saying this in the temple. He's holding the Christ child in the temple, the center of the whole sacrificial system for human sin and guilt in Judaism. We're in the temple where his parents have come to sacrifice living creatures, these two birds, to offer up the lives of these two birds for their sin. In a way, it's not just that Mary and Joseph can't afford that yearling lamb, right, and have to use a pigeon. That's the practical reason Luke wants you to see. The theological reason I suspect that's in the back of Luke's mind is that the real sacrifice for their sin is the baby they're carrying in their arms. It's the baby Simeon came to see and has found and is holding right now as he sings. And maybe Simeon doesn't fully understand this, but you and I who know the rest of Luke's gospel, who know that the cross is where this baby's life journey is heading, we know it. We know that Good Friday stands over this story, even though we feel so close to Christmas right now. Two, this baby is not just Simeon's salvation, but the entire world's. That's the other point the song wants to make. It's a very short poem, just four verses, but half of it's focused on the universality of the salvation that Simeon has found in this child. Starts at, start at verse 30. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all people, that is the salvation you have set in this moment, that you've set into motion in this moment, in this particular moment, this particular place, Roman-occupied Judea, where Jew and Gentile, Israel and pagans, in other words, everybody, have gathered. In the last two lines, verse 32, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles, that's the nations, everybody else, and for the glory of your to your people, Israel. Okay, so let's step back for a moment and look at this. Uh, one way to summarize the story behind the Old Testament, and this might be familiar to you if you remember the Abraham series we did, a, I guess maybe a year back now. Um, one way to summarize the Old Testament story is that God chose a person, Abraham, to reveal himself to, to get close to. And Abraham is to become a people, a nation, Israel, who will know God too. And Israel's become a blessing to all the other nations, all the world, in that knowledge. Right? Specifically in there being a light to all the other peoples of the earth, a light that reveals God, who really God, who God really is to them. And so it's a story, or at least the Old Testament's supposed to be a story about people who know God and who know God, who God is for them, and who then show other people what it's like to know him, right? Showing other people what lives look like when you know him. But it's also a story about people who, like us most of the time, or at least me, fail to do that and fail pretty miserably at it, right? A people who, rather than reveal God to the nations, try to be like the nations, try to be like everybody else. A people who turn to idols they can fashion and gods they can use and manipulate. You see, the, the pagan gods of ancient times tend to be very local, provincial, ethnic, ethnic, nationalistic deities, right? That is, they are for you and for you alone, but in a very shallow way, right? They are your gods, but they operate on kind of a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately logic. Uh, they are fickle and demanding, but they are manipulable, right, if you know what they want. And the story behind the Old Testament, and what Simeon is getting at here, is that the God of Israel isn't just the, uh, isn't just the God of Israel. He's the God of everybody, and not in a shallow way, not in some fickle or controllable way. And if Israel on her own is not going to lead everybody else back to him, 
If Israel's not going to reveal him to the world and thereby save the world, then God himself is going to become an Israelite and do the job on behalf of Israel. And that's what this baby, this Christ child, is, is that the Simeon's God of Israel is. isn't just the in the, uh, he isn't just God the God of Israel. The nations, He's the God of everybody, and not in a shallow way, not in some fickle or controllable way. And, that and if Israel on her own is not going to lead everybody else free, back to him, this is all according if Israel is not going to reveal God's him to the world and thereby this save the world, then God himself is going to become an Israelite and, and do the job on behalf of Israel. And that's what this baby is, Christ child, is that the God of Israel isn't just the he isn't just the God of Israel. He's the God of everybody, and not in a shallow way, not in some fickle or controllable way. And if Israel on her own is not going to lead everybody else back to him, if Israel is not going to reveal him to the world and thereby save the world, then God himself is going to become an Israelite and do the job on behalf of Israel. And that's what this baby is. Christ child is that the God of Israel isn't just the he isn't just the God of Israel. He's the God of everybody, and not in a shallow way, not in some fickle or controllable way. And if Israel on her own is not going to lead everybody else back to him, if Israel is not going to reveal him to the world and thereby save the world, then God himself is going to become an Israelite and do the job on behalf of Israel. And that's what this baby is. Christ child is that the God of Israel isn't just the he isn't just the God of Israel. He's the God of everybody, and not in a shallow way, not in some fickle or controllable way. And if Israel on her own is not going to lead everybody else back to him, if Israel is not going to reveal him to the world and thereby save the world, then God himself is going to become an Israelite and do the job on behalf of Israel. And that's what this baby is. Christ child is that the God of Israel isn't just the he isn't just the God of Israel. He's the God of everybody, and not in a shallow way, not in some fickle or controllable way. And if Israel on her own is not going to lead everybody else back to him, if Israel is not going to reveal him to the world and thereby save the world, then God himself is going to become an Israelite and do the job on behalf of Israel. And that's what this baby is. Christ child is that the God of Israel isn't just the he isn't just the God of Israel. He's the God of everybody, and not in a shallow way, not in some fickle or controllable way. And if Israel on her own is not going to lead everybody else back to him, if Israel is not going to reveal him to the world and thereby save the world, then God himself is going to become an Israelite and do the job on behalf of Israel. And that's what this baby is. Christ child is that the God of Israel isn't just the he isn't just the God of Israel. He's the God of everybody, and not in a shallow way, not in some fickle or controllable way. And if Israel on her own is not going to lead everybody else back to him, if Israel is not going to reveal him to the world and thereby save the world, then God himself is going to become an Israelite and do the job on behalf of Israel. And that's what this baby is. Christ child is that the God of Israel isn't just the God of Israel. He isn't just the God of Israel. He's the God of everybody, and not in a shallow way, not in some fickle or controlled way. And if Israel on her own is not going to lead everybody else back to him, if Israel is not going to reveal him to the world and thereby save the world, then God himself is going to become an Israelite and do the job on behalf of Israel. And that's what this baby is. Christ tells us that God of Israel isn't just the God of Israel. He's just the God of Israel. He's the God of everybody, and not in a shallow way, not in some fickle or controlled way. And if Israel on her own is not going to lead everybody else back to him, if Israel is not going to reveal him to the world and thereby save the world, then God himself is going to become an Israelite and do the job on behalf of Israel. And that's what this baby is. Christ tells us that the God of Israel isn't just the God of Israel. He's the God of everybody, and not in a shallow way, not in some fickle or controlled way. And if Israel on her own is not going to lead everybody else back to him, if Israel is not going to reveal him to the world and thereby save the world, then God himself is going to become an Israelite and do the job on behalf of Israel. And that's what this baby is. Christ tells us that the God of Israel isn't just the God of Israel. He's the God of everybody, but not in a shallow way, not in some fickle or controlled way. And if Israel on her own is not going to lead everybody else back to him, if Israel is not going to reveal him to the world and thereby save the world, then God himself is going to become an Israelite and do the job on behalf of Israel. And that's what this baby is. Christ tells us that the God of Israel isn't just the God of Israel. 
Jesus is the God of Israel. Jesus is the God of everybody. Not in a shallow way. Not in some fickle or controlled way. Israel on their own is not going to lead everybody else to ask him. It's all out. Israel is not going to be in the world where I save the world. That is not going to be coming to the world. It's not going to be on the side of the world. It's not going to be on the side of the world. And that's what this thing is. It's not going to be on the side of the world. It's not going to be on the side of the world. God of Israel isn't just the God of Israel. It isn't just the God of Israel. It isn't just the God of Israel. It's not going to be on the side of the world. You live with your death in front of you. And not just the big one, right? 
But with all those little ones that happen every day, to paraphrase Shakespeare, the fearful taste death many times before their deaths. But when you have seen your salvation, what it looks like in Christ, none of that matters, right? <clears throat> he basically cheated while watching a movie and read the Wikipedia entry on the, life, on, the, uh, on the movie of your life, right? You've skimmed down to the bottom, read that it, everything turns out pretty spectacularly in the plot, all because of Jesus, right? And so now you can continue watching the rest of the movie without being afraid. Or my daughter and I, uh, we've been watching a Star Wars cartoon series lately. Don't judge me. Um, and every once in a while, she gets really scared and ba that bad things are going to happen to characters she likes. And I just have to remind her, Zoe, doesn't Anakin need to be in the later movies? And she's like, oh, yeah, he's Darth Vader. And she breathes a sigh of relief. Now, maybe that's not the best example, OK? But hopefully you get my point. And it's not just that that stuff doesn't matter. It's not just you can brush stuff, brush stuff off or reduce your anxiety. That's not, necessarily, that's not the whole of what it's about. Having seen your salvation in Christ, knowing that sin and judgment and death are truly behind you, actually empowers you to truly live. If I can, uh, if I can let me give you a rather macabre example. Um, Japanese samurai. Uh, if, if you can imagine what they look like in full armor, right? They typically have these beautiful ornate helmets that they wore in the battle that would you know, be in the shape of beasts or spirits, right? You know, one to scare the enemy, but also to be a reflection of their inner spirit, right? That kind of thing. Now, before a battle, what a samurai would do uh, is he would burn incense underneath his helmet, right? He just flood the helmet with this fragrance, the thoroughly scented. But it's not for him. It's not like some sort of air freshener for him while he's fighting, okay? It's because if he fell on the battlefield, what would happen is his head would be taken from the field and brought formally to the enemy daimyo or lord. It would be formally presented to that lord. And when they lifted the helmet from the head and from the daimyo, that fragrant aroma would fill the room, the smell of that incense. Think about that, right? As part of his preparation for battle, a samurai prepared his head for formal presentation. He's thinking about the aesthetics of his severed head. He went into the battle mentally with death assumed, with his death, if you will, behind him. And if you know something about martial arts, you know there's a certain logic to that. If you are focused on protecting yourself, you cannot attack the enemy, certainly not wholeheartedly. A warrior caught up in his fear of dying on the battlefield might survive the day, but he will not live as he is trained to live as he is called to live on that field of battle. And there's an image of truth there for us. When we're caught up in fear of whatever, of death, of shame, of judgment, whatever, it's really hard to live, live fully, live abundantly as you're meant to. It hamstrings us, it holds us back. It's only when we know that all of that is behind us, that the chains fall away, and you can focus on living freely, boldly, confidently, in the knowledge of, of the love of God and his only son, Jesus Christ. Um, tonight is New Year's Eve, yippee, right? Uh, I don't have, I have kids, I don't have any plans. I, um, my wife tells me that there are optimistic people in the world who focus on all the positive stuff from last year and the positive stuff that's gonna happen New Year's. I guess I have to believe her, um, but for me and for many, it's a tough time. Um, it can be tough, especially because everyone seems so festive. It's often a time for regrets, for things I should have done, for things I shouldn't have done, for losses, for hurts, uh, for things I want to work on and get better about, things I feel bad about. You know, you kind of look at your goals list in your planner from 2017, and you're kind of like, who wrote this, right? Start working out. Somebody was pretty ambitious, right? Um, and that's what resolutions are usually about, trying to address the regrets, the places of shame, of judgment. And then when we fail, there's just more of all that. Now, I realize I'm not going to convince you all not to do New Year's resolutions. In purely practical terms, they're not bad. Working out would probably do me some good, right? Don't, don't reply to that. But don't make resolutions from a place of self-judgment or shame or what have you whether of the past or in terms of how they're going to turn out in the future. Instead, do so confidently 
in the knowledge that in the, in the knowledge of the salvation you see in Jesus Christ. Okay? You have been set free from the consequences of failure in your life. You are no longer a slave to the law. You are no longer a bond servant to demand and obligation. And that means you are no longer subject to the judgment that comes with failure, no longer under the threat of shame. In Christ, you have been released from your bondage. You are not a slave. On the contrary, in Christ and through Christ, you are a son of the Father. You are a daughter of the Father. That is your true life forever, including right now. And so you don't honor and serve your father like a slave under expectation and threat and punishment. You honor and serve him like his child, like his heir. In the knowledge of his unconditional love and forgiveness. In the truth of his joyous delight, a father's delight in you. All the resolutions in the world won't fix you. But knowing that gospel truth, knowing that salvation, and standing in the love of God found in Christ, that changes everything. Thanks be to God. Amen.